The first thing we'll cover is your troubleshooting mindset, the way you approach and think about network troubleshooting overall. The second thing we'll cover is what I call the troubleshooting triad. This is a method I recommend you use for studying for the exam, and this also ties into your exam preparation mindset. Finally, we'll cover the way you take the exam. I'm not talking about the obvious stuff like sitting down in a chair and clicking the mouse. I'm talking about everything you do during the entire exam day, from the moment you wake up to the moment you walk out of the testing center. Let's start by talking about your troubleshooting mindset. Now, my point here is not to get you to psychoanalyze yourself, but rather to draw your attention to some incorrect assumptions that you might make when it comes to troubleshooting. First of all, troubleshooting is not configuration. There are two big things that differentiate troubleshooting from configuration. In troubleshooting, you have tighter constraints, that is, what you are and are not allowed to do. We've seen these on trouble tickets in the previous courses. They say things like, don't modify any routing configuration or don't modify the configuration on such and such a device. On the other hand, when you're configuring a device from scratch, you pretty much have free reign to do whatever you need to do to get it working. The second difference between configuration and troubleshooting is that when troubleshooting, you generally have less time than you would just performing a rote configuration. Now, this is pretty obvious when you think about it, but here's why I bring it up. When you're configuring a device, you have a checklist that you must complete, even if it's just in your mind. You think, well, I got to configure my IP addresses, routing, ACLs, and so on. Check, check, check. Now, when doing a configuration, you check everything on your list, and you probably go over it more than once just to make sure you didn't miss anything. But contrast that with troubleshooting, wherein you focus only on what is not working. You hone in just on what's broken, and you leave the rest alone unless and until it becomes relevant to the particular problem you're working on. Now, that doesn't mean troubleshooting is quick. It's quicker than a configuration from scratch, but the key difference is how you spend your time. The specific tasks you perform when troubleshooting are very much unlike the tasks you perform when doing a configuration. When doing a configuration, most of your time is spent banging out commands at the command line. When doing troubleshooting, most of your time is spent diagnosing and thinking about the problem. It's only after you have a good idea of the cause that you actually start making changes at the command line. Now, if you're like me, you tend to think with your fingers. I just think better when my fingers are typing commands. Now, that's great when doing a configuration, but it's rather terrible when doing troubleshooting because in troubleshooting, you have to think while not typing. You have to think while looking at topology diagrams while playing out scenarios in your head, while writing down notes on your scratch pad, and while reading output. Your fingers have to disengage for much of the process, and if you're not used to that, it can quite literally make it hard to think. This is why I've hammered this point from day one. Practice troubleshooting. That is what's going to prepare you for the practical aspect of the exam more than anything else. Let me ask you something. In what order do you study the exam topics? What do you memorize? How do you decide? Now, some would say study and memorize everything, and that may sound like a good approach, but it's extremely time-consuming and inefficient. So it probably won't surprise you that I'm going to teach you a methodical approach to preparing, and I call this approach the troubleshooting triad. The troubleshooting triad has three layers. At the foundation, you have concepts, which you can also call the theory. This includes not only in-depth knowledge of various protocols, but also why those protocols work the way they do. For example, conceptual or theoretical knowledge of OSPF would include not only how OSPF areas work, but also why they exist in the first place, what problem they solve. Directly on top of that, you've got terminology. This includes generic terms like link state advertisement, BPDU, and neighbor discovery, but also Cisco-specific terminology like ether channels, Cisco discovery protocol, feasible distance, and so on. At the very top, resting on the bottom two, you have commands. These are very Cisco specific and they're obviously very important because they're what you're going to bang out on the command line when taking the exam. Now let's talk about why the order of the triad is so important. Concepts are the foundation of your networking knowledge. I expect you already fully understand that and I don't need to convince you of that. But the way you know you have a good conceptual knowledge of a topic, say spanning tree for example, 
is to explain a spanning tree topology to yourself or someone else. Be able to draw and label diagrams and explain intricate details such as why bridge priorities are in increments of 4096. If you can do that, then you know you've got a good conceptual understanding of the topic. Once you have the concepts down, start learning the terminology. A big mistake I've seen people make is to start memorizing terms without having a clue about the concepts the terms describe. Terms without concepts are meaningless. The whole point of technical terminology is to provide a convenient way to refer to concepts. But terms are anything but trivial. They are what allow exam questions to be three sentences long rather than three paragraphs long. So you must know the terminology well in order to understand the exam questions. But not only that, there is another very important reason to learn terminology. Commands are built on terminology. And think about that. Almost every one of the commands you use in iOS includes a technical term or abbreviation. For example, the OSPF router command area one no dash summary refers to an OSPF area and summary link state advertisements. If you know your terminology, commands are much easier to memorize and you can often guess the commands you don't know. If, on the other hand, you don't know the terminology, it's easy to get confused. Think about the terms of BPDU filter and BPDU guard. Now you can have a good understanding of BPDUs. You can memorize those commands that are related to BPDU guard and BPDU filter, but if you don't know the specific meaning of those terms, then you've got a problem. Now you might think, well, what's the difference? Can I just memorize commands and what they do rather than worrying about the actual terminology? Sadly, no, and the reason is that Cisco often uses different terms to describe the same concept. For example, port channel, ether channel, port bundle, and channel group all mean the same thing. The command you use to configure a port channel is channel-group, but the command to view port channels is show ether channel. Now, if you don't know the terminology well, you might not realize that those commands, which appear to be very dissimilar, are actually very closely related. The bottom line here is that if you know the concepts, terminology, and commands for every topic on the exam, it's almost impossible to get a problem wrong. But if you're missing any one of these pieces, the whole thing falls apart. If you know the commands and have a dictionary definition of terms, but you don't have the concepts down, well, the whole thing falls flat and you're not gonna do well. If you know the concepts and the terminology, but you don't know the commands, you're gonna to have to figure out the commands as you go and that will cost you valuable time on the exam. But master the concepts, terminology, and commands in that order and you'll be in a really great position to pass the exam. I'm assuming that you've already taken IT certification exams before, so I'm not going to rehash the obvious exam day tips like arrive on time and make sure you bring your identification and so on. Instead, I'm going to provide some hopefully not so obvious tips that have helped me tremendously in passing the CCNP exam. First of all, get to the testing center early. I'm talking 15 to 20 minutes early and bring study material with you. Study and review until the proctor calls you back to secure your belongings, which, by the way, can take a long time. One testing center I tested at multiple times had only one person proctoring, and she was always running behind. It wasn't her fault, but it was common for this place to be at least 30 minutes behind schedule. Now, what happens when you're sitting there for 30 minutes waiting to get called back? That's right, an exam-related question will pop into your mind, and you won't know the answer to it. Now, if you have your study materials handy, you can quickly get the answer just before sitting the exam. Think about that. If you have 30 minutes to study just before entering the exam room, how much of that material are you going to forget over the next two hours? That number is probably pretty low. Now let's talk about during the exam. If something about a question seems wrong, it's probably not. For example, let's say that a multiple choice question has no correct answer or that a simulation is giving output you just know is wrong. Remember that thousands of people have seen the same question, so chances are if you notice the problem, someone else noticed it too and they already reported it. Do not get frustrated or annoyed about it. Instead, assume that there's not a problem with the problem and ask yourself if there's another explanation because chances are there is. Saying I'm right and Cisco is wrong is not going to get you any points on the exam. Humility goes a long way here. 
Now, suppose you've been working on a simulation question for several minutes and you get stuck. You don't want to get the question wrong, but you also don't want to use too much time. Here's my advice. Quickly do whatever you can to solve the problem, even if it's just a wild guess, and then move on to the next ticket. Cisco does give partial credit, so if you end up fixing something, don't sweat it too much. Partial credit is better than no credit, and who knows, even a wild guess may turn out to be right.